Next on Broadway Profiles, Ethan Hawke is here to talk about his new novel, his hit TV series, and a new theatrical experience unlike anything you've seen before. Plus, from Broadway to the blacklist, Tony Winter LaChance is here to talk about her new character in the long running TV crime drama. And a little bit later, Office Space. We're on stage for the socially distant and safe return of live musical theater in New York City. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. So glad you could join us. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and just like always, we've got a lot to talk about. But right now, we're going to kick things off in a big, big way. Ethan Hawke might be the busiest man in show business. So far during the pandemic, he's released a hit TV series, a new novel, and now a star-studded, first-of-its-kind virtual theatrical production of the iconic play Waiting for Godot. We talked about all that and a whole lot more. Samuel Beckett, what a day to be talking about it. And Waiting for Godot, I feel like we really understand what that is all about these days, especially when it comes to Broadway. Boy, isn't that true, you know? I mean, I, I never even imagined that Broadway could be dark for a year. If you had told me that even two years ago, I would think, what are you talking, I mean, it went dark for like one night on September 11th. What would possibly do that? When the pandemic first began, you know, I have four kids and I thought it would be really, you know, we were sitting around the house doing nothing all the time or trying to figure out things to do together. Right, right. You know, so I had this bright idea that we'd light a fire and we'd sit around the fire and, and read Waiting for Godot. Um, oh, wow. And, and we did. And it, it felt like a new play to me in this context. I mean, just listening to people talk about not being able to remember whether it's Saturday or Wednesday or Tuesday. And it stopped being absurdist mm -hmm. in this kind of goofy, let's make a existential point way and started to be ferocious. Like it, it started to be, you know, like something tactile. You know, we've seen a lot of virtual productions over the past year, obviously, and I've been fascinated to see what what people did to you know be creative or to feel something in all this but what you have going on with godot it's not a standard zoom camera but this is more a, a real theatrical experience meets film right you know it was one of those ideas that grew as we worked on it i've loved john legazamo for you know since i first moved to new york and i called him up and we started reading through the play and we we're like wow this is incredible like maybe this shouldn't be just a reading. What would happen? And there was something about talking to each other on Zoom that seemed to elevate. It was like, oh, you know, sometimes people set Hamlet on a spaceship or something and, and it right. you, you hear the play differently. Well, there was something about the loneliness and estrangement that the characters were feeling that seemed to be extremely alive. And then once we had it memorized and we're working on it, we started thinking it was really interesting. So we put better cameras in. And then this set designer, Derek McLean was like, let me build you guys a set. We got mailed a set to our apartment. And, and you know, I, I mean, listen to this. I had COVID, right? Oh, I, I had it. That. My wife and I had it and we had to build our set. I mean, I've never been so sick in my life and trying oh. to build this God <laughs> set. Uh, the more time we put into it, the more we started to believe in it. I think it, to us, it, it felt like fighting for the theater. All right, let's talk about your writing, uh, Bright Ray of Darkness. It is on my Audible. I've been listening to it. This is uh, your first novel in 20 years. I, I love the fact that it has a fascinating look that most of us don't get to see of behind the scenes of, of a Broadway show, of how it's really put together. We see what happens afterwards, but we don't really see how it's all put together. So what gave you the idea to bring that to the world? I'm an old actor, but I'm still a young writer. You know, I, I haven't... I, I, I'm interested in writing and I'm, I'm a student of it. And I kind of felt, fell back on that first writing class rule of write what you know. Like if you, Don DeLillo or any fancy pants author out there would need to do, you know, 30 years of research about the theater to catch up with me. I mean, this is one area where I actually know something about it. And so that gives you an opportunity to perhaps offer something to the reader. The healing power of performance is something that's had incredible meaning in my life. And there's a lot of tabloid journalism about actors, mm -hmm. but there's not a very, there's not too many 
books you can find in the library that are fiction and a first account of the experience of what it means in a more substantive level to dedicate your life to performing. My name is Captain John Brown! John Brown, real life famous abolitionist leader. The show is incredible. It starts out with all of this is true. Most of it happened. For somebody that has not seen The Good Lord Bird, what does that mean? It means you have an unreliable narrator, you know? I mean, what we're, what, it's one of my favorite novels I've ever read by James McBride. And a lot of historical fiction pretends that it's the truth. And all of it has a point of view. We know the truth is so mysterious, you know? And the thing that I really love about McBride's writing is he owns the point of view. The whole story is being told by a 14 year old kid who is completely a bull artist, right. you know? <laughs> You've been reading the Bible. Not too much, Captain, but I've been thinking it's golly way. If we can work with that, you stand for the Lord. The Lord will stand for you. What I love about it is because it deals so completely and uh, beautifully about race in America and some of the sins and crimes in the DNA of this country, by dealing with it with such a sense of humor, it, it kind of knocks you to the left and lets you listen. McBride tells the story of John Brown a little bit the way Richard Pryor or Chris Rock or Red Fox might, you know? It's, it's incendiary and mercurial and you don't know what's gonna come out of his mouth. And in this age, we're all so worried about saying the right thing and doing the right thing all the time. It's just like, it's a wave of honesty and love and silliness. And I hereby order you to get, get in his holy name. How do you summon John Brown's energy and fire with some of those speeches? Because they just go from here to here. I felt when I was playing that part that 30 years of acting was required. Every, playing Macbeth, Stoppard, Sam Shepard, all my experiences in the theater were required to play a character kind of of that quote unquote import. You know, I felt like I was playing a, it's like the first person who got to play King Lear or something. You know, I mean, sure. the challenge was so high and it also required everything I knew about making movies because it was not a play, it was a movie. So it was, there's something very theatrical about the good Lord Bird. It's playful and wild and big and bold and works in big gestures and broad strokes and, and, and yet it is cinema. This is Frederick Douglass. David Diggs real fast, just to see him there. Uh, you know, he famously played Lafayette and Jefferson and Hamilton. Now Frederick Douglass, uh, talk real quick about his performance. I was blown away by him. Obviously, every time I see him, I, I, this he has that wild energy of a star. You know? Yeah. He was doing a play at the public and I went to see it. The play was incredible, but my eye kept going like, oh my God, what if he played Frederick Douglass? And so, uh, oh. And so I went up to him afterwards and started courting him. Working alongside your daughter. Highlight of that? my life. Well, That's you know, great. watching kids grow up and watching them become themselves is really a powerful experience. I knew she was in trouble. She came to see me do the dress rehearsal of, I was doing The Winter's Tale. Sam Mendes was directing it at BAM and Rebecca Hall was in it. And Maya, I don't know how old she was, 11 or 12 or something. She watched the whole run through just hypnotized by Rebecca Hall, <laughs> you know? And when the run through was over, I said, listen, I'm gonna take you home now. We have a short break because we have to run through it again. You know, mm -hmm. she said, could I watch it again? Oh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a three hour Shakespeare play, you, you know? And she was 12. And I thought, you really want to watch it again? She's like, could I? <laughs> so I was like, oh, you're done. You're it's done. Over. The new group's production of Waiting for Godot is available May 6th. Check out thenewgroup.org for more information. We also had a chance to talk with two of Ethan Hawke's co-stars, Tariq Trotter and Wallace Shawn. What this represents is the launch of the new group Offstage, which is uh, this new venture. Um, and they're going to be, you know, creating theatrical expressions in different media. So this was, uh, this one was about as different as, as they come. 
And uh, I was really up for the challenge. It's a real movie. It's a film. It's sort of basically four different strange, dark dreamscapes. I personally think it's, it's a very original interpretation simply because of the intimacy with which it's done. I mean, it, we're all in close-up. Through set design and, and editing and um, just, you know, being on, on the same page uh, creatively and performance-wise, it gives you, I think the, the final product gives you the feel of us having been in the, in the, in the same world. What an actor. The man has not made many, I mean, he hasn't been a professional actor, but he is extraordinary. And, and everything he does is kind of beautiful. I mean, I suppose it's because he's a musician. So there's one more note about the new production of Waiting for Godot. Our friends at Broadway Wine Club have partnered with the new group for an exclusive wine tasting experience while you watch the show. If you go to broadwaywineclub.com right now, you can sign up for a VIP pass to the virtual show, plus two exclusive bottles of wine. They're called Waiting for Pinot and the New Grape. It's a cool deal you definitely don't want to miss. I am so excited about this one. A few weeks back, we talked to our friend Tony Winter Lachance about her role in the hit NBC show, The Blacklist. And now we can tell you, she plays a rare love interest for James Spader's character, Raymond Reddington, which makes her a crucial character for this eighth season. We caught up with Lachance for a quick update. To come into this show at this point uh, in the development of their story, um, it's actually been a, a pleasure for me because um, I get to fall in love with this dynamic, powerful man who um, has had this history that my character doesn't really know about, but um, but the intensity of their relationship is so palpable. And James and I have great chemistry anyway, so to be able to play this role has been a thrill. It is, is so thrilling for me. Is there anything I can do to help you? You're already doing it. I'm serious. So am I. Out there, my life is so complicated, and here, it's not. I want to do more than help you set aside your burdens. I want to help you carry them. Because they're so quiet about what's happening, I didn't even know that it was going to be so intense. I didn't, you know, I didn't get the script until, you know, a little bit before I had to shoot. And um, I did get a call um, just from from um, the showrunner explaining to me that it was I was going to be doing a pretty intense episode. Um, but when I read the script, <laughs> remember, I was laying in bed late and I was just flipping, reading it off my laptop. And when I got to the end of the episode, I stood up out of the bed. I like was like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, I was not ready for that. I wasn't ready. And here I am reading the part that I'm playing. And I was completely involved, enga engaged in what I was reading. They had me going. I, I wasn't even being LaShawn's playing this part. I was a, like a fan reading the script going, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. There is still a lot more to talk about on this edition of Broadway Profiles. Coming up, Broadway couples in quarantine. We're talking to the hilarious husband-wife duo, Rob McClure and Maggie Lakus. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles. The plan is in motion to get New York's theater community vaccinated and safe so we can get Broadway back in business. In the meantime, though, we're still here telling the stories of some of our favorite stars. Paul is here with another one of our favorite Broadway couples in quarantine. Rob McClure and Maggie Lakis are celebrating a decade of marriage, raising their little girl, and still finding new ways to keep fans entertained during the shutdown. This month, they're starring at a drive-in theatrical production of Treasure Island. You were both gearing up for Rob to become the busiest man in show business. You started performances of Mrs. Doubtfire. This would have been the biggest undertaking of your career. And then suddenly, no, you just get this beautiful time together as a family. I didn't know what to think of it because we didn't know how long it was going to be. In a way, it was kind of like easing into this year because at first it was, oh, was it two weeks that they said? Yeah. And then it's like, okay, a month. And then it just right. and then it was like September, but I think by the time they said like a month in September, I think we knew it was going to be 
oh, it was going to be a while, but it kind of was like he's in the, the starting blocks and they say on your mark, get set. And then it's like, hold, pause. To be honest with you, I still don't know if I fully processed the sort of grief of the loss of that moment. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I, I think I just jumped right into like, protect yourself, protect your family, wear a mask. What do I have to do? How long is this going to be? And I think the, the moment that a lot of the Doubtfire company sort of registered what had happened um, was when our, our beloved cast member, Doreen montalvo Man passed away. And it was the first moment that we all thought, oh, even when we come back, it's not going to be the same show we were doing. And then we started to think about what our show is ultimately about and like mm -hmm. redefining who you consider your family and what the, what a family can look like and what does it mean to be family. I think we're all going to feel that in an elevated way coming out of this. You have this beautiful toddler at home <laughs> and, and I know that you were kind of emotionally figuring out how you were going to go to the city every day and do eight shows a week as Mrs. Doubtfire and be apart from her. Yes. And, and and now you, you've you been able to spend all of these golden days with her. It, it's a gift that we've had this time. It's such a formative time in her life where she's literally saying new things every single day. Um, but then at the same time, it's like you can't bring her to a museum. And even like at the playground, you know, most of the parents are pretty good and the kids are pretty good, but it's weird to not really be like, go in there and play with those strangers. You know, you're right. kind of separate, pull her back from people. So and I think, I, I think a lot of parents are going through that in this time where they have like kids who are going through developmental times and other kids are things you don't get too close to. That's a hard thing to have to like, uh, we're sort of planning how to unteach that. We just have to surround her ease her back in there and then get used to bringing her to cast functions so she can just be around as many people as possible. You're actually getting to get on an actual stage together. You'll be in Treasure Island. Talk about it. We both love Treasure Island and that story. And Come on, it's pirates. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so finally resounding this amazing company that Steve Wargo founded, um, they finally reached out and were like, we have a venue, Real Park, and it can be socially distanced. It can be safely done and it will be a live in-person performance. And I think both of us were like, when? Yeah, <laughs> when? When is it we're there? We'll get a babysitter. When is it we're there? And still ahead, welcome to Dunder Mifflin. Live musical theater returns to New York City. We're gonna take you to the return of The Office, a musical parody. This is Broadway Profiles, and we'll be right back. You know, we're still several months away from the reopening of Broadway, but live musical theater is now finally back in New York City with new safety precautions. Broadway.com correspondent Charlie Cooper is here with more on the story for us. The Office of Musical Parody is one of the first off-Broadway shows to return since the closing of theaters due to COVID-19. We spoke with the cast and crew about what audiences can expect and how they plan to keep them safe. The most interesting part for me is the fact that, of course, a woman is playing Michael. Oh, yeah. Um, talk to me about the opportunity for just anybody to um, audition for that role and why you guys made it that way. So when we started writing this, we said, how do we make this a parody? How do we parody? The Office is one of our favorite TV shows. And it felt like Michael Scott needed something to really add that layer of parody. And when we thought, let's have a woman do it, it made it all make sense. We're looking for somebody who can embody the character, but not necessarily, doesn't have to look like them, doesn't have to be the same type, race, anything. Yeah. So we do a full open call. Uh, really, we're looking for someone who has, I can't explain it, who embodies, embodies the, character, the character, brings their own uncomfortable silliness, awkwardness, funniness to it. So let's talk about Kelly Kapoor. How closely do you feel like you relate to her character? I relate to her immensely. Um, my family would say I'm a lot like her. I know there's a lot of the times now, even now I go home and I somehow end up just saying some of her lines not on purpose. So I do feel like I really pull into the Kelly character. You know, sometimes she thinks takes things a little too far, but that's what makes playing her so fun. There's no repercussions for it because it's just acting. The air quality in the theater is monitored 24 hours a day, and this air scrubber keeps the air clean for those coming in and out. I promise not to be too mean, but I need to make sure that everyone is wearing a mask. We have hand sanitizers added throughout the entire theater, um, both backstage and on stage. 
We've done a lot of social distancing uh, with where we're going to seat people in different pods with the group they came with and then six feet apart. And then the cast and the crew has also been all vaccinated in addition to the front of the house people. For those who are unsure about just being in a space where there are other people, what do you say to them and um, why should they come out to see the show? We say that come when you feel comfortable, right? Because we're taking all the steps. We feel safe doing this. Our actors feel safe, the crew. Everything feels safe and we're taking all the precautions but we want people to come when they're ready. All right, we'll be right back. And that's gonna do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com.